If you're just getting an astrophotography, then you might be a little bit disappointed by the quality of the images you're getting. Most likely your images have a lot of grain in them. If you try and bring up the shadows in post-processing, you might notice a purple glow somewhere. Or if you're on a Canon camera, you might see a lot of vertical or horizontal banding in your images. All of these different problems are caused by not capturing enough light in each exposure. And that's really our goal at night, is to capture as much light as possible. So if you want to take your images to the next level and cover up all those annoying problems, a star tracker is going to be one of the best investments you can make. In this video, I'm going to break down a few of the most popular star trackers. We're going to take a look at what I like about each one, also some of the annoying problems with each one. And by the end of the video, you should have a much better idea of which route you want to go down. The main star trackers we're going to be looking at today are the Sky Guider Pro from iOptron, the Move Shoot Move, and the Skywatcher Star Adventure. Based on everything I've seen, these are the three most popular trackers out there. They each fulfill a slightly different role. And ultimately, it's going to be up to you to see which one you want. You know, if you're just doing Milky Way photography, you might want to go something like the Move Shoot Move here, which is small, portable, and lightweight. However, if you think you might want to do some deep space astrophotography, then the Sky Guider Pro or the Star Adventure might be a better choice. But we're going to take a look at each one in a little bit more detail and move on from there. Before we go any further, I want to do a quick comparison between a Star Tracker and a GoTo map. So all of these star trackers, for the most part, are very lightweight, portable, and small. You can throw them in your backpack if you want to go out and do some camping and Milky Way photography. These are all going to work great. However, for deep space work, you know, if you want to photograph the Orion Nebula or some of the other nebulas or galaxies up there in the night sky, all of these different trackers, you can do that. However, they don't have what's called a go-to functionality, and that means you have to find everything manually. This can be a real pain, even if you know exactly where to find the object, depending on the lens you have, how good your eyesight is, and a whole lot of other factors, it can take you up to an hour, in the worst case scenario, to actually find an object. And that is the first thing I wanted to stress, is that if you're mainly interested in deep space astrophotography, you can do it, especially with the Sky Guider Pro or the Star Adventure. Just keep in mind, they don't have as many advanced features as a go-to map, and that might cause you some headaches down the road. On the flip side, all of these trackers are very easy to use. You know, there's not much going on here. You turn it on and it just works for the most part. And that helps to simplify some things. Whereas if you had a big, heavy go-to mount, there's so many little things that could go wrong and you could spend the whole night troubleshooting random problems and never even take a photo. Whereas with a Sky Guider Pro or a Star Adventure, like I said, you can turn it on, do a few small things, and unless the tracker is broken or you really mess something up, it's going to work for the most part. So keep that in mind as well. If you're just getting into the hobby, you might want to start off with something a little bit more simpler until you really understand all the concepts, get your uh, more comfortable with that, and then at that point you might want to invest more in a larger go-to mount. The first star tracker we're going to take a look at today is the Move Shoot Move. This is the newest star tracker on the market compared to the others, and it's also one of the cheaper options out there, which is probably why it's so popular. One of the things I love about the Move Shoot Move, of course, is that it is so lightweight and portable. As somebody who does a lot of hiking and backpacking and Milky Way photography, the portability really does go a long way. I can grab my tracker, throw it in my bag, and go on an overnight backpacking trip and not even notice that it's in there. And the great thing is you can go find a nice foreground, set up, take your shots, find a nearby field without too many trees in the way, set up your tripod and your star tracker, and then take your tracked images. When you get back to the computer, you can very easily blend them together. Another nice feature of the Move Shoot Move is that you can either use a laser pointer or a polar scope using this little 3D printed bracket and screws. Well, the bracket's metal, but the screws are 3D printed. And I've got, for example, the laser pointer here in my pocket. What you would do, I got the polar scope first. So this is going to be used, this polar scope, you're going to slide it in here, like so. And now you're going to see a reticle inside the polar scope when you crouch down. You need to align Polaris at a certain spot on that circle. And to do that, you look for an app on your smartphone. There's a lot of choices out there. The app will show you where to position Polaris. And then once you know that position, you aim this roughly up towards that portion of the sky. Turn your azimuth and altitude screws here on the base until the star is as close as possible. That's one way to do your polar alignment. Although it is kind of tricky for a lot of people, but that's where you're going to have to start to learn to do it. One of the nice things, though, is that if you're just doing wide-angle Milky Way photography, 
You can also get a laser pointer for the move, shoot, move, provided it's legal in your country. And this laser pointer, same deal here. You're gonna slide it in, and now you just turn it on, move the base here until the laser pointer is pointed right up at Polaris. At that point, you've done your polar alignment in just a few seconds, and you're ready to attach your camera and ball head here and begin shooting. So in terms of ease of use, the move, shoot, move is one of the best options out there if you're just trying to do Milky Way photography. It's easy to use, lightweight and portable, and you can even get with the laser pointer, which will really help out. Moving on, uh, you can also do some time-lapse photography with this tracker. For example, you could put it flat on a ball head, and then it would turn your camera around. They even recently came out with two different, I guess you could call them platforms. One of them is called the Z platform. I forget what the other one's called, but you can kind of see it here. And this just helps you to get a level kind of shooting service. I'm still messing around with these. I don't really have too much in the way of a review on these yet. But that brings me to another thing I like about Move Shoot Move is that they're constantly improving and updating the product. You know, when I first got mine, it didn't even come with a base. You had to use a ball head, which wasn't great for doing your polar alignment. It was very inaccurate. But now they've gone through, they've designed their own wedge or latitude base. And this altitude knob is very smooth to use. Same with the azimuth screws here. And again, this is just gonna make your polar alignment process much easier. Not to mention that the base here is very lightweight and portable as well, which matches with the move, shoot, move. So that's one area where I really got to give a big plus to Move Shoot Move is the fact that, again, the company is constantly improving and updating their product. Whereas Skywatcher and Ioptron, they've had their trackers on the market for probably five years now, and they haven't done any updates for the most part, even though they could really use them. So I do want to commend Move Shoot Move for actually sticking with their product, fixing anything that they find that doesn't quite work as well, and just continuing to provide a quality product. Now let's talk about some things that I don't like about the Move Shoot Move. First is the battery life. It's only about five hours. However, you can charge it with a USB-C cable to a portable battery brick. So again, if you are going hiking, you might already have a little portable battery. You can plug it in there, keep it charged up, and five hours, it's pretty short battery life. Some of the others can get up to 24 or 48 hours of total battery life before you need to recharge or put in new batteries. So that's one area where the Move Shoot Move doesn't quite hold up as well as the others. Another problem with the Move Shoot Move is it's really only good for Milky Way photography. Because there's no counterweight system, you can really only attach a ball head and your camera. And if your camera's too big and heavy, you're gonna start to stress out the small motor and gears in here. So that's something else you wanna keep in mind is how heavy is your camera and lens that you plan on using. I've personally been able to shoot sharp exposures anywhere from 60 seconds to four minutes with a Nikon D780 and a Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter lens. If you add all that up, that's a pretty beefy setup on here, not to mention the weight of the ball head. And overall, the tracking accuracy seems fairly good. I have heard some reports where the tracking accuracy could be a little bit better. And I would think that's just due to the overall design of the Move Shoot Move. Because it is so small and compact, it might not have as good of internals as something like the Skywatcher or the uh, Skyguider Pro. So that's something else to think about. Again, I would only really recommend this tracker for wide-angle Milky Way shots. If you want to do deep space, this is not the tracker to buy. The maximum focal length I would put on here is probably a 135mm lens, something that's fairly lightweight. If you're trying to use a 70-200, to that's just going to push this thing over the limit as far as I'm concerned. And you might damage the tracker, if not your camera gear as well, if everything falls to the ground. So this is a great option if you're just looking for a lightweight, entry-level, portable star tracker for Milky Way photography. But for anything else, you might want to choose another option. Next up, we have the iOptron Skyguider Pro. This has been the tracker I've used the most over the last four years, and it's held up to just about everything. I've used it in the backcountry for Milky Way photography, and I've also used it in the backyard for deep space astrophotography. Like the Move Shoot Move, it is pretty compact and lightweight. It's not nearly as small as the Move Shoot Move, but at the same time, this doesn't take up too much space in your bag. You would just attach a ball head here and then your camera, and you're ready to start shooting. If you did want to do deep space astrophotography, it also comes with a counterweight kit, which will be installed right here on the front. And then from there, you can attach some pretty big telephoto lenses or a fairly small telescope as well. One of the nice features of the Skyguider Pro is that there is a polar scope built into the device, so you don't have to worry about losing it. It's always in there. And when you look through here, you're gonna see the traditional reticle in there. That's gonna help you do a precise polar alignment. 
And then after you've done your polar alignment and attached all your gear, you can still look through here and double check your polar alignment at any time if you're gonna be using a telephoto setup. So that's another nice feature of the Skyguider Pro. In addition, there's even a red light function, which when the tracker's turned on and this red piece is rotated to the correct angle, the reticle will light up with a red light and that will allow you to see the reticle better at night. Although the way I have my configured, it doesn't really work that well, but at least that feature is there for those who want to utilize it. Personally, I just shine a red headlamp over the front and that works well enough for me. Uh, so in terms of the overall design, it's a great star tracker. You'll notice I've got a different base down here though from William Optics, because that's one of the big problems I have with the Skyguider Pro is that the included base is really terrible. The screws are very hard to turn, they're cheap plastic, and very often the knob will fall off and you have to screw it back in. And overall, the included base is just not very good. The other bases that you can get are a lot better with the other star trackers. So that'd be one area where I have a problem with the Skyguider Pro is that you pretty much, I mean, you don't have to, but if you're trying to do deep space astrophotography, you really wanna consider upgrading to maybe the William Optics base or even the Skywatcher base. That's even a little bit better than the default Ioptron one. Another problem I have with the Skyguider Pro is the declination bracket. So overall, I like the design of the declination bracket because this is what's gonna allow you to use a big telephoto lens. You can pretty easily attach it right here like so. You've got your counterweight here and then your camera would attach up top here. But the problem I have is that the overall design up top here isn't the best and you tend to run into some problems, especially if you're trying to get, for example, the Orion Nebula dead center in the frame. If I do the smallest adjustment like this, it might drift completely out of the frame at 600 millimeters. There's no way to do a very fine, smooth adjustment, at least that I found. And for that reason, the Skyguider Pro is a bit of a pain to use for real deep space work, again, 600 millimeters and higher, just because this declination axis adjustment isn't very easy to do. And that's even with the improved William Optics components that you see right here. You don't need these, but I ended up getting them just to do a review on, and they work well enough that I'm still using them. Another thing to keep in mind about the Skyguider Pro is that I've taught a lot of students over the last couple of years, and you know, my Skyguider Pro, I've never really had any issues with it per se, but a lot of my students have had serious problems with theirs to the point where in some cases they couldn't even shoot for the night. Maybe their clutch here would get stuck open, or even when they tightened it down all the way, things would still move very easily. And what that translates to is you'd spend an hour getting the Orion Nebula dead center in the frame, you touch the camera a little bit and it moves. And that just makes you want to rip your hair out. So there's a lot of these little problems that I've seen that go from mildly annoying to show stopping in the middle of the night. And for that reason, I think Skyguider Pros in general, they seem to have some quality assurance issues, which I would have hoped iOptron would have fixed by now. But it seems like every so often I hear from somebody and they're just having some of the same problems that a lot of other people have reported. That's not to say that any of the other star trackers have any better QA, because I've heard a lot of problems with the other ones as well. But having the most experience with the Skyguider Pro, I can say that the quality assurance does seem to be lacking to some extent. Overall though, I really do like the Skyguider Pro. Like I said, I've been using it for the last four years and it's allowed me to get some really incredible shots. Once you work out a few of the little quirks of it, it does work really well. And it is, at the end of the day, a very dependable tracker, provided you get a model that actually works and not one of the lemons out there that has a lot of problems with it. Let's move on now and talk about the iPolar version of the Skyguider Pro. They're almost identical. The only difference between the two models is that the original Skyguider Pro has a polar scope in here that you can look through to do your polar alignment, which I really like. The iPolar version, rather than having a polar scope, there's actually a little camera here instead. And that's good in some scenarios, but bad in most other scenarios. Because let's think about this. If I wanna take this on a hike or a backpacking trip, if I have the iPolar version, I now need to lug around a laptop with me because since there's no polar scope, I can't just look through here and do my alignment. So that's already a big negative for the iPolar is that you need a laptop to do your alignment from now on. Another problem with the iPolar is that I don't even think the software works on Mac computers. I might be wrong on that, but as far as I'm aware, there's only an EXE file for Windows machines. And on top of that, the software itself isn't very good at all. It works, but it could be a lot better. What I wish they would do is include some type of Wi-Fi connection so you can do everything from your smartphone. That would be a much better alternative. So at the end of the day, I would only recommend getting the iPolar 
if you plan to shoot in your backyard or if you're in the southern hemisphere because if you're in the southern hemisphere your polar alignment process is much more difficult you don't have a big bright star like polaris and a lot of people have trouble doing the alignment using a polar scope however the eye polar kind of solves that problem it can see the stars do what's called plate solving so it identifies where all the stars at and know where it's pointed and it tells you how to adjust your base here and the way the software works is you see a red circle and a crosshair provide you're aimed up close enough and then from there you adjust the azimuth and altitude screws while you're looking at your laptop until the crosshair and the circle line up that's how you do your alignment with the eye polar so for most people i recommend you stick with the original sky guider pro with the polar scope the eye polar is great in theory but in practice it's just another headache and one more thing you have to worry about mainly bringing that laptop out there on the location with you the only people i'd really recommend getting the eye polar to is if you live in the southern hemisphere where it can really help but for most people just stick with the original sky guider pro and that'll work pretty well for you next up we have the skywatcher star adventure this was one of the first star trackers to hit the market a couple years ago and since then it's become probably the most popular star tracker out there a lot of people have used this to get some great photos for both milky way and deep space personally though i'm not that big a fan of this tracker just because there's a lot of little things that drive me crazy and i think that's where we'll start off with the first problem i have with this tracker is the overall design it's by far the biggest bulkiest and heaviest star tracker of all the ones we've talked about today and if i'm going on a hike or a backpacking trip this would be the last choice i'd bring because it just does not fit in my bag very well so that would be the first problem i have is that compared to every other tracker this one is a pain to deal with in addition to that there's a lot of cheap plastic covers that fall off very easily and it would be not at all uh, improbable to say that this will fall off in the middle of the night and you'll lose it forever so one thing that would help is to just get some black tape and tape the battery cover down that way it doesn't fall off in the middle of the night speaking of batteries it uses four AA batteries here and that'll get you about 72 hours of runtime if i remember correctly so that's a good amount of time this is pretty efficient when it comes to the battery use personally though i don't really like AA batteries because very often i'm driving out five six hours to the backcountry and i don't keep spare batteries in the car so that's one problem i have is that you do need double a's whereas the sky guider pro and the moose shoot move those have an internal rechargeable battery however there is one nice feature here and that is the dc 5 volt usb cable which should keep this thing powered if you have a little power brick it uses that weird type of usb cable though so you have to find one of those if you don't already have one uh, but it is nice that you don't actually need the double a's if you don't want to you could just plug this into a battery like any other star tracker and that brings me to another problem i have with star adventure which is the rotary dial here for whatever reason they have this controlling whether the star tracker is turned on or off and i can tell you from experience it's very easy to accidentally turn this on without realizing it put it in your bag and leave it running for who knows how long maybe even a couple days straight and every other star tracker has a dedicated power button that you can turn on and off and i've never had a problem with any other star tracker turning on by itself the star adventure though completely different story like i said i've even just thrown this in the bag and that's enough to accidentally turn it on and leave it running another problem with that is if you have this trying to turn while it's in your bag you know very slowly it's possible it's going to hit the edge and not be able to turn and it might fry the motor now there's supposed to be some type of internal mechanism to prevent that from happening you know if it realizes it's stuck it's not going to force it but it's just something to be aware of and really the the only workaround that i found to prevent this from accidentally turning on is to just pull out one of the double a's that way it can't turn on something to keep in mind anyway just another reason why the star adventure has a few little design problems that make it annoying to use that's really all the negatives i have though for the star adventure everything else is pretty good the polar scope in here gives you a nice wide view of the sky you see there i almost pulled off the battery cover when i was trying to hold it and the reticle is very sharp and defined however one problem that i do have with the polar scope is there's no built-in red light illuminator so when you're looking through here at night you're not going to see the reticle it does come though with a cheap crappy little plastic red light thing you can put on the front of here that doesn't work very well and you'll most likely lose the component within a month and for that reason everybody using the star adventure i recommend just having a red headlamp flashed over the front while you're looking through there that will allow you to see the reticle and then position polaris as needed so that's just 
one more problem with the Star Adventure is that there's no built-in red light function, whereas the Skyguider Pro does have a built-in red light illuminator. This one does not, though. The clutch system is very robust, and this can handle anything from a 14 millimeter lens all the way up to about a 600 millimeter lens. And once you lock down this clutch, I mean, it's really not going anywhere. That's one area where the Skyguider Pro, as I mentioned, if you tighten this down, it can still move and ruin your compositions and drive you crazy. So I do like the fact that the Star Adventure seems to be a little bit more robust when it comes to this clutch. And when it's tight, it's actually tight. So they did a good job on that at least. Now let's take a look at the base. The Skywatcher Star Adventure base does a really nice job. The altitude knob is very smooth and easy to adjust. You can even go all the way to 90 degrees. And the reason you'd want to do that is maybe you want to have the Star Tracker straight vertical, put your ball head on here, and then you could do kind of like a panning motion for a time lapse. So this does open up quite a few interesting possibilities. And overall, this base is much better than the Skyguider Pro's included base. The screws here, again, are easy to turn, and that's going to help for doing a precise polar alignment. So they did do a nice job on the base. And next, let's talk about the declination bracket and counterweight, which you'll need to use if you plan on using a telephoto lens. I've got the counterweight and declination bracket right here. It's pretty small, compact, and lightweight, which is a nice change. And the counterweight itself is not very heavy at all, which is actually a bit of a problem because if you want to use a big telephoto lens on here, again, maybe something like a 150 to 600 millimeter lens, this counterweight's usually not enough. And I wish they would have given us a bigger, heavier counterweight to balance a bigger setup. So because they didn't do that, we have to kind of get creative. And there's a lot of different things you can do. I've got some other videos that go into that more. So that would be one problem I have is that the counterweight isn't heavy enough for a lot of setups. But when you do attach it, it works pretty well. And that brings me to one thing I really do like about the declination bracket. And that's what they call, I think, the fine tuning assembly, which is this knob right here. This is gonna allow you to do very small, smooth, and precise adjustments when you're trying to frame up your object at night. For example, maybe the Orion Nebula is a little bit off center and you just wanna get it a hair to the left or the right. You can do that fairly easily with this knob right here. You just turn it one way or the other, take another test photo, and make sure you got it where you need to be. This might not sound like much, but I can tell you from experience, this will save you so much headache, especially compared to the Skyguider Pro. On the Skyguider Pro, you have to loosen two screws and turn your whole camera and lens yourself. And that's just almost impossible to do at 600 millimeters. Even if you have Orion a little bit off from the center, if you do that on the Skyguider Pro, it might drift out of the frame completely and you have to go hunt for it again. That's not a problem here with the Star Adventure though, with the fine tuning knob here. So again, that might sound like a small improvement, but it really does come in handy for deep space work. And there's not much more to talk about with the Star Adventure. All things considered, it's a solid, reliable star tracker. There's a few annoying glitches with it, including the on and off dial here, which changes the tracking speeds, the batteries, and the counterweight. Those are the most important things that I've noticed. Those could all use some work. And that brings me to an important point. Skywatcher recently released the Star Adventure 2i version. When I first heard about this, I got pretty excited. I thought they were going to fix all the problems with this and create the next generation of the Star Adventure, and I was really stoked. Unfortunately, when I saw what it actually was, it was a big disappointment. The Star Adventure 2i is literally the exact same thing as you see here. The only difference that I could find is that they put in a little Wi-Fi chip, which allows you to connect your smartphone to the tracker through uh, the SAM console app, which is nice to some extent, but it's almost useless. I mean, if you're doing a lot of time lapses, it might come in handy, but for the average person, it's more of a gimmick than anything as far as I'm concerned. And I wanted to bring that up because I thought that was a big missed opportunity. There's so many annoying little things with the Star Adventure that they could have fixed with this 2i next generation, it sounded like, version of the Star Adventure, but they chose not to for one reason or another. All they did was include a little Wi-Fi adapter, basically. And I wish they would have at least fixed some of these cheap plastic covers and things like that if they're gonna bother re-releasing the Star Tracker. But maybe they're working on that and they'll have it come out within a year or two, who knows. As I was going through and editing the video, I realized I didn't spend enough time talking about auto guiders, which is really important for deep space work. Both the Skyguider Pro and the Star Adventure can utilize an auto guider, 
which you see here. This has two cables that come out of it. One plugs into the back of the star tracker into the guide port. The other cable is going to plug into a laptop or something like the ASR Pro. And the end result is that a signal is going to be sent to your star tracker every two or three seconds, and that's going to make it run much more accurately. In my experience, I was able to go from sharp stars at 30 seconds to sharp stars at three, four, or even five minutes with a 600 millimeter lens. It really is a remarkable difference. And therefore, if you do plan to use the Sky Guider Pro or the Star Adventure for deep space work, I'd highly recommend looking into getting an auto guider. I've got this article here on my website, as well as a few videos that go into more detail. Unfortunately, the Move Shoot Move Star Tracker cannot utilize an auto guider, and that's okay because, like I said, the Move Shoot Move really shouldn't even be used with a big telephoto lens. You'll probably break it. So in that case, you're not really missing out on much. But both the Sky Guider Pro and Star Adventure are going to work much better if you do get an auto guider. At this point, we've covered the three most popular star trackers, the Sky Guider Pro, the Star Adventure, and the Move Shoot Move. However, there's multiple other trackers to choose from, and I talk about those in the article I wrote over on my website. I'll have a link for that in the description. In that article, we also take a look at the Sky Tracker Pro, the Star Adventure Mini, and I think we talk about the Vixen Player a little bit. Those trackers are okay, and they'll work for some scenarios. But in general, I wanted to focus on the three most popular options in this video. So again, if you want to learn even more about trackers and delve into the differences in even more detail, check out that article on my website. And that brings us to my final recommendation. Out of all the trackers I've used, I still prefer the Skyguider Pro. It just has the least amount of annoying problems with it. And that really is what it comes down to. Because when you're out here at night, these little problems are going to start to drive you crazy night after night. And for me, the one that drives me the least crazy is the Skyguider Pro. It's also the most reliable. I know it's going to work, and where I know it's going to have problems, I know how to fix that. For example, if I had a big telephoto lens, let's say a 150 to 600 millimeter, I know I can only shoot about 30 seconds before I get star trails. However, if I use an auto guider, now I can comfortably shoot three, four, or five minutes without star trails. That's a massive improvement in terms of tracking accuracy. So if you want to learn more about auto guiders, I've got two or three different videos here on YouTube that will go into more detail. And I'd only recommend doing that after you've gotten your tracker and got some experience. It's not that much of a thing to learn, but it is a little bit confusing at first. So that's only going to be required if you plan to do deep space astrophotography. For Milky Way, don't even worry about it. And if you do decide to get the Sky Guider Pro, remember, I recommend the Polar Scope version. That's going to work fine for 95% of people. However, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere or you just have really bad eyesight and you want to use your laptop to do the polar alignment, then you can consider getting the iPolar. But I think a lot of people are going to struggle with the iPolar and it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. Regardless which star tracker you get, they're all going to do a good job and they're all going to allow you to shoot much longer exposures with your camera. The more light you capture, the better the final image is going to turn out. And that's always what we're trying to do, is get the best possible image quality without breaking the bank. And if you do decide to pick up any of the star trackers we talked about today, and you're unsure of how to actually use it, be sure to check out the full courses I have over on my website. I've got a full course dedicated to each of the most popular star trackers out there. And what I do in those courses is I walk you through the entire process from start to finish. We talk about planning your photo shoot, what camera settings to use, what additional camera gear you might need and what you don't need to buy, more importantly. We go out there on location, I show you how to set everything up step by step. We walk through the entire process and then we do the post processing. So once you have your foreground and your track sky shots, you can blend the two together very cleanly and get some great looking photos. And I'll have a link for those courses in the description below. That's all I've got for you today. Hopefully this made your choice a little bit easier if you're thinking about getting a star tracker. Like I said though, there's still a lot more to cover. I've just kind of scratched the surface in this video. So to learn more, be sure to check out the article in the link below. And I'll see you guys in another video.